absolutely will become that by default unless we continue to refresh it on purpose. The battle that we all have, and we all have the same battle at many points, it is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Even in a marriage, whatever's happening, our spouse is the one that we focus on, whether good or bad. But really, the biggest enemy is a, it is a spiritual enemy that is fighting to mess us up, mess up everybody else in our world, keep the seed of the word from finding root, you know. And uh, we, need to, we need to fight that by calling upon the Lord and asking him to give us what we need. When we say, give us this day our daily bread, we need to be praying that. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. You know, your fathers ate the man in the wilderness, they died. But I am the living bread. If you eat me, you'll never die. You'll never hunger. You'll never thirst. All those things have nothing whatsoever to do with the sermon this morning. <laughs> But I feel like there is, a, there is always within us a tug like gravity. It is a tug like gravity pulling us away from the things that matter. Mm. You know, it's, and, and it will suck us in automatically if we do not do some things to keep it from sucking us in. An airplane cannot fly. You know, I mean, it's impossible for something that heavy to go up in the air that is not heavy. It requires some specific energy to keep it moving. Because gravity works. But the same is true even in, in a setting like this, as far as hearing the word. As far as having a marriage. You know, by default, if we keep doing what we've been get, doing, we'll keep getting what we've been getting and we need to be continuing to refresh. And on a Sunday morning, as we gather to hear the word, we need to be asking God to continually cause his word to come to life for us. So Jesus is way beyond any given label that we can put, it, uh, put on him. You can't put Jesus in a box. You can't call him liberal. You can't call him conservative by today's use of the term. Because according to many things, it was the really conservatives of the day that just couldn't tolerate what he was saying. You know? Uh, and yet at the same time, today, many of the things that what we call liberal today is not even on the same hemisphere with the kind of things that Jesus proclaimed and taught, whatever. Labels just don't fit. Jesus is truth. Truth remains truth. The constant. You know, in science, there are various hypotheses and whatever. And there are things that were perceived 30 years ago or 10 years ago even to be true that have been disproven today. And now we know, you know that those things were not true. It was never true in the first place. Truth doesn't change. Understandings of the world, understandings about truth can change, but truth never changes. You know, truth is said, Jesus said yesterday, today, and forever. He said, I am the truth. The truth stays the same. It's just that our understanding of the truth needs to be continually tweaked to be brought into line with uh, genuine truth. Okay. Um, political winds come and go. Societal norms change. Things that are going on today would never have been thought of going on, even just when I was a kid. Now, back in ancient Rome, they may have gone on all the time. You know, and different societies have different things. Societal norms come and go, they change. But truth stays constant. We need the, the, the current political winds are not a reliable gauge of what is true. The truth, so the, the passage this morning has to do with judging one another. And uh, it is in our series, we've been preaching through the life of Jesus for the last year or two or so, I hope you're not bored to death, um, but um, 
In recent times, we've been going through the Sermon on the Mount because that's where we were in the life of Jesus. And down towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount, in Matthew chapter 7, Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And in chapter 7, verses 1 through 5, Jesus said this, Do not judge, or you will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. Let that little hammer soak in for a minute. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? King James says a moat in your brother's eye, a beam in your eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye? When all the time there's a plank in your own eye. You hypocrite, first take the plank out of your eye, your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Don't judge. Now, a few weeks ago, before kind of the Christmas season, and we had kind of shifted gears a little bit during that, uh, that season, but a few weeks ago I preached on this passage, and I want to give a little bit of a recap about judge not. And we're going to go pretty quickly here. At least I plan to go pretty quickly. We'll see. But... Um, First thing was, Jesus said, stop judging by mere appearances. Folks, the obvious is not always the actual. Not everything that we see, not everything that we hear is what we think it is. God is the judge. We do not have all of the information. Uh, not all that we see, not all that we hear is true. As believers, we're not to be judging other people. So we're not to be judging in hypocrisy. That hypocrisy is the kind of thing where, you know, I'm holier than thou, and I have it all together, and you need to do this, 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 and this, because, you know, I, I've got it all together. If there's anything that stinks in the nostrils of God, it is hypocrisy. And folks, we all have that gene. <laughs> It is easy for us to fall into that, and it stinketh to the Lord. And we need to uh, not be judging in hypocrisy. Let's evaluate ourselves first. Third, there are some things, it's not the time to judge. You know, we can look at certain things and say, okay, wow, that's really stupid. Well, maybe, maybe not, you know. I mean, uh, I, I find myself saying, we'll see, a lot. Because there are a lot of things about which we'll see. You know, I mean, time will tell whether this was a good idea or a bad idea. Some things take quite a while to unfold, but there are some things that are, are true, thus saith the Lord, and, you know, that's how they are. But there are other things, it's not our job to judge. It's not the time to judge. Fourth, we're not to slander or speak evil of one another. Uh, God is the judge. See, and how we judge, we will be judged. Man, that ought to give us pause. This is one of those statements, like Jesus said earlier, when he was teaching his disciples how to pray. You know, uh, if we, we forgive, you know, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive. That's a mouthful. Okay, so now, don't judge. Got that down? Quit it. Stop it. Straighten up. Let's not be judging one another. Now, the other side of that issue, because this is not a one-sided coin. The Bible clearly commands us to judge some things, some people, some circumstance, some circumstance, and forbids us in judging in others. Now, to judge when we should not judge is a problem. To not judge when we should judge is also a problem. We need balance. We need wisdom. We need the Holy Spirit because when we simply pull out one side of a coin and ride off into the sunset with it, we are often missing vital truths that we need in order to have the balance in our lives. Are you picking up what I'm laying down here? Sometimes silence is golden. Sometimes it's merely yellow. 
we need to know the difference. Sometimes we need to speak up. Sometimes we need to shut up. Sometimes we even need to stand up. And sometimes we need to sit down. And again, we need wisdom and the Spirit of God to direct us because both of those things are true. We need the Spirit of God to direct us into His Word. Some use this verse as a cop-out <coughs> to avoid standing against anything or anyone. But folks, we've got to call sin what God calls sin. We must stand for God and against unrighteousness. We're called to do that. That requires some judgment, some discernment, some understanding, some decision making. We live in a world where truth is turned on its head. Today, if a person stands against evil or sin, that person is perceived as evil. Who is evil except the person that calls evil evil? See, you know, to judge evil is among society's worst sins. Tolerance is society's greatest virtue, or one of them. We are to tolerate any kind of evil, make excuses for every kind of screwball behavior. No one is responsible. Everyone is a victim. But the fact is that only truth works. Truth works because the world is an orderly place created by an orderly God and the things of God, the things of truth work. And they work today, they worked yesterday, they'll work tomorrow, they're constant. Now that doesn't mean that everything that we do according to the truth is going to be to our immediate benefit. You know, I mean people, Jesus was absolutely truth and they hung him. Well, that doesn't mean everything that it turns out the way we want it to, but truth works for time and for eternity. God commands us to judge or discern people, ideas, or things in at least four different ways. Uh, <clears throat> the first thing, we must judge between right and wrong. Now, you know, maybe that goes without saying, but it seems like somebody needs to say it. This is my turn. I, I just said it. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus speaking, he said to the crowd, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say it's going to rain. And it does. Now, if you're in Israel, remember the maps of Israel, if you're in Israel, off to the west coast is the Mediterranean Sea. If there's going to be any moisture coming upon the land, it's going to be coming from the Mediterranean Sea, not the desert on the other side. Okay? He says, you, you get that. When you see a cloud, you say, ah, oh, it's going to rain here. And when the south wind blows, you say, it's going to be hot. And it is. Hypocrites. You know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and the sky, how is it that you don't know how to interpret the present time? Why don't you judge for yourselves what is right? See, Jesus is exhorting his followers to judge what is right. We need to continue to make that evaluation as we go along and not allow the winds of popular opinion to form our views of truth, of what is right and what is wrong. There's all kinds of strange things happening today that society is calling good. Society is calling evil good and good evil. That's not where we as believers are to be. We are to judge rightly. In John chapter 7, verse 23 and 24, Jesus again says, Now if a child can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing the whole man on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances and make a right judgment. Evaluate what's going on. What is going on in our world today? Jesus commands a proper evaluation of truth. We cannot get off the hook saying, oh, judge not, the, be not judged, that's not my call. Well, if it isn't your call, don't make it. But if it is our call, then we do need to make it. And as it, as it comes to the, the, the difference between right and wrong, we need to make that call, at least for ourselves. Hebrews chapter 5. Again, the writer of the Hebrews is writing to the church, and it seems like there's a little bit of, what is going on with you? And here's what he says. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
You need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. How many have been saved more than five years? <coughs> okay. Well, listen to this. Though by this time you ought to be teachers. <laughs> time in grade does not always bring about growth. You know, there are some people that have not had 20 years of experience. They've had one year's experience 20 times. There's a lot of difference. Okay? As believers, how many of us kind of just recycle? We don't get in and dig to grow and mature and develop. Okay. Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's Word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The, see, as believers, we are to be in training. We are to be training ourselves and one another and all the other kind of things that, that go up a part of that. We are to be trained to distinguish good from evil. How does that happen? It does not happen just by watching TV. It does not happen just by going on the internet. It happens as we get into the Word of God, as we interact with the preaching and teaching of the Word of God, as we exhort one another, encourage one another, stir one another up, that's how we train ourselves to determine good from bad. If we simply allow the society around us to mold our thinking, we'll think like everybody else in the society. But we're in training as believers. You with me? In first Thessalonians, and so we, we must distinguish that there's a judgment involved. And finally, in 1 Thessalonians 5, and there's a lot of other verses that can be applied here, but we must judge between uh, uh, good and evil. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 uh, through 22. Be joyful always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. Those are challenging statements. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. We must judge between good and evil. Second, we must judge between sound doctrine and false doctrine. Between false prophets and true. Between teachers that are teaching truly and those that are not teaching truly. We, we just have to evaluate those things. We can't just say, tut tut, judge not, be not judged. We, are to, we must evaluate that. Spiritual fads and schools of thought come and go. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said this, starting in verse 15, and uh, that it, it kind of follows what we're doing now, but it says, watch out for for false prophets. Watch out for them. Why? Because they're everywhere. Yeah. Why do we need to watch out for them? Because they are stinking everywhere. Back in the day, a false prophet had to wander through Nazareth. Today, they wander through your living room. All you got to do is punch a button and you can hear them. Watch out for false prophets. Have you ever noticed that all the TV programs, the ones I like at least, and the ones that you know probably uh, many people like, there is always the token evil. Always. But it's not held up as evil. Uh, some is. But often it's held up as, boy, this is the epitome of cool. That's a false prophet. There are all kinds of false prophets. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing. Inwardly, they're ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will know them. You will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes? They pick, pick figs from thistles. Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. An apple tree cannot bear thorns. And a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. 
thorn tree can't bear apples. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you'll recognize them. Now see, folks, if, if by their fruit we will recognize them, that requires some judgment. That requires some discernment. It, it requires watching out for false prophets. You with me? We must evaluate the difference between false and true. We can't get off the hook by simply saying, oh, judge not. There are Within Christianity, there are all kinds of cults that are teaching faulty doctrine. They're kind of Christian, maybe almost Christian. Certainly they're religious, but they're just a half a bubble off a plum, just enough to mess us up. They're, that's within Christendom. Then you have, today, widespread atheism. You know? We have humanism, which is its uh, sin twister, you know. <coughs> New Age spiritualism, you know. There's And then, to say nothing of Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism and all the other isms. So in our world today, we live in a plethora of false prophets. Yeah. And unless we are training ourselves to distinguish, we can easily get sucked in because much of the language is the same. You can hear people talk about having a nice Zen moment or whatever, you know. Sounds so cool, hip and suave and swell. I don't even know what a Zen moment is necessarily. But, uh, you know, the, the, the point is that, that in today's age, there's this religious smorgasbord. And unless we are training ourselves, disciplining ourselves, getting into the Word on our own, hearing it preached, hearing it taught, interacting with that, we will just drift along. And we need to evaluate how we are, what's going on in our age. Anyone that is not proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ, if they're proclaiming anything religious or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Okay, if they're not talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're false prophets. You know, there's a lot. You can reach, look on the tabloids at the supermarket talking about God. And there are people who talk about the Holy Spirit. And there are people who talk about all kinds of even stuff, religion of every kind. And if we're not paying attention, we can say, well, gee, isn't that nice? But if they're not talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, you know, died a vicarious death in our place, you know, was buried, was resurrected from the grave, is coming again. They're not talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's a false prophecy. It is a false set of ideas. We just need to be alert to that. You know, we don't need to hang them or shoot them or whatever. We just need to be alert that we don't get swept into that kind of frivolous fluff and folly. In Matthew chapter 16, starting in verse 5, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this among themselves and said, it's because we didn't bring you bread. <laughs> Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, you of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000, how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? <laughs> but be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. See, folks, it is the teachings that are available that can really tweak our minds. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 15. The Apostle Paul is speaking to the church. He says, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what is right. Folks, listen, I would say that to you. You owe it to yourself and you owe it to me. If I'm standing here preaching and proclaiming the world, you owe it to yourself to be pondering it. Judge for yourselves. Pay attention to what I say. If you believe it just because I said it, you could be an idiot about other stuff. You know what I'm saying? 
If you believe it just because I say it, see, if I can talk you into something, somebody else can talk you out of it. But judge for yourselves what I say, and judge for yourselves what other people say. This needs to happen all the time. It should happen. It does happen all the time at leadership. Because leadership on Wednesday nights, and anybody that wants to come is welcome to come. We invite you. But on Wednesday nights, there is all this, there's discussion about all kinds of stuff, and we need to evaluate what is being said. Because just because somebody launches an idea doesn't mean that it came right down from heaven on a sheet. It could be a really stupid idea. We need to evaluate it. Could be a great idea. See? But we are to judge for ourselves what is right, and as iron sharpens iron, and as we interact with one another in all kinds of ways, we help train ourselves to in this business of evaluating. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, speaking of the various gifts of the Spirit, Paul says some are given the gift of distinguishing between spirits. King James says discernment of spirits or discerning of spirits. This requires some judgment. Now, all of us from time to time need to do it, but some are more particularly gifted. You know, and my experience is those who think they're gifted, um, I'm discerning a spirit of lust, um, you know, what do you know what I'm saying? Okay. Rarely have I been impressed with that. I don't think it's some kind of fancy mumbo jumbo, but it's something that God has given to people to determine, is this thing of the spirit of God or not? Not everything that comes out even of believers' mouths is of the Spirit. Not everything that comes out of my mouth is by the Holy Spirit. You know, I mean, I have the flesh hanging on. You know, the enemy sometimes gets there and tweaks me. There's, I, there's a lot of strange stuff comes out of my high hole here, you know, from time to time, sometimes in public. Uh, but we need to discern, we need to evaluate, we need to hold one another accountable. Okay, so uh, it requires some judgment. Uh, so, uh, so the next thing I want to look at is to talk about the gifts of the Spirit again. Because there's a lot of funny stuff that happens surrounding the gifts of the Spirit. They've almost been placed into a special category that's kind of woo area. Are you with me? I, I, I've seen lots of funny stuff there. Now, the power and the beauty of it is when regular people in whom Jesus lives do what they should be doing because we all see things differently depending on how God has gifted us or equipped us or whatever. And we need one another because a gift person with a gift of administration sees things differently than the, with the gift of giving. And on you know, and teachers see it differently and ask different questions and all of those sorts of things. We need that in the body. I believe those things function in the body. But when it gets up here into the stratosphere, I think then often we get into the realm of the emotion alone and we miss engaging with the heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, uh, and here's 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Here's what the Apostle Paul says. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. Now, that is a very important phrase. Oftentimes, Somebody will hijack the train and start telling hunt stories or whatever, right? And they can go on and on and on and on because they don't know how to find the off button. And other people are wondering, they're just pretty dear to Jesus, let me get out of here and I'll be a missionary to Africa, you know, whatever. I mean, oh, you know what I'm saying? So it's not necessarily what they say is bad, it may not be even evil or any such thing as that. It's just that, you know, it's out of place. They just, okay, well, anything that is said as we're gathered in more of a public setting needs to be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or three at the most should, uh, should speak, one at a time, and someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. The King James says, let the other judge. Okay? So whenever we're gathered or whenever we're having a conversation, uh, many, many times in the midst of a conversation, I'll be, and I don't know, it shows on my face, I think Rena knows sometimes it does, and some others go, okay, what are you thinking here? Because somebody will say something, and I'm going, hmm, you know, is that really true? Or is it really, is it always true? You know, and I'm, because I'm interacting that way, and many of you do the same thing. Because just because something is said, and again, it may be me that's saying it, but I'm thinking about it in this context. 
But over in this context, it may be wildly misleading. And you're thinking over here, and that's why we need to bring one another to this kind of accountability. It's a part of our training to distinguish true from false, good from bad, uh, truth from error. Uh, going on then in 1 Corinthians, he says, If a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. Look, if people are not being instructed or encouraged, it's probably out of line. Now, it may not be wicked, sinful, or evil. It may not be even false prophecy. It's just that, you know, come on here. You know, it's not instructing or encouraging. You with me? We just, that's what it's supposed to be within the life of the body. That's a guideline for us. The spirit of prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Again, whenever folks get into the situation where, gee, I just don't have any control of this. The Holy Spirit just took over me and made me do crazy stuff. No. The Holy Spirit doesn't do that. If you're being taken over by some kind of spirit and you don't know what's going on, it's not the Holy Spirit. Because the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. You know, God speaks to us. He speaks through us, but not up there in the, you know, in the atmosphere where you know we don't know what's going on ourselves nobody else does either are you, are you picking that up it's important in this passage because see as believers we are to be judging in a proper sense what's happening around us so the ecclesia of god the church of god must be involved in judging prophets and prophecies teachers and teachings is this really so many examples of that in scripture uh, third, sometimes we must judge those within the fellowship. That's another area that sometimes it's required. Now, you've got to kind of hang with me here, and we've got to be very, very, very careful here. There is great danger both in judging and in not judging. But there's a needed ministry of judgment within the body. Let me share with you 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 9. I've written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. Not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy or swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you'd have to leave this world. But now I'm writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. Boy, this is a delicate thing, you know, and it's what look, we all have this treasure in earth and earthen vessels. Anybody can mess up. I can, you can, all God's children can. That's you know. But it is a different thing when someone is claiming to be a brother and then flaunting sin and wickedness and evil, or for whatever reason they're just living wicked, God, ungodly lifestyles. When that becomes known to the body, the body needs to deal with that. That's not okay. And that's a hard thing within the church. We often don't want to do that, but it's, it's a requirement that, that God has given to his people. We, we are accountable to one another. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, starting in verse 1, If any of you has a dispute with another, dare he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints? Do you not know that saints will judge the world? I don't know what all that means, but that word. Uh, if we are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? Look, I don't know what all that means about judging the world and judging angels. You know, so... I don't know, that's one of those things maybe you know, uh, but I don't know. I've heard a lot of interesting theories about it. But whatever it is, but the, and that really is not the point. The point that he is bringing, and he goes on and says, how much more are the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little account in the church. Again, that's a phrase that is variously interpreted in the various translations. It's, uh, you know, but he says, I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there's nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? See, that's the issue. Are we going to have disputes in the body? Uh, duh. Right? Gonna happen. I mean, it, it, it just, because it's life. We 
we live in a broken world. We're going to have challenges in this life. But instead, one brother goes to law against another, and this in front of unbelievers. Folks, there's a lot of times when we need to bring in someone else in the body to say, you know, I'm having this disagreement, you know, somebody, I, some, this guy doesn't like the overhead, and this guy really likes the overhead, and this guy wants us to sing out of a hymnal, and this guy wants us to, you know, somehow we need to just deal with that. But what happens in our world today is so often people just take the ball and go home. Nobody else even knows what's happened. You know, the pastor said something they disagree with, and so they're out of here on a fast train. pastor never even knows the difference. Now, it may be that the pastor should have had somebody tell him, hey, you said this and that was wrong, or whatever. That should happen. But there needs to be those within the body that from time to time are, are being peacemakers, evaluating, judging, discerning, and sometimes even making a decision saying, look, okay, you know, you need to sit down. Look, we've, we've heard what you said. Okay, we believe you're wrong in this matter, so get used to it. You know, get over it. Deal with it. Or whatever it happens to be, but to bring that peace. That should happen in the body. It's supposed to happen in the body. Yeah. One of the most prevalent things that I have been involved in in some years is even at the point of divorce. Now, folks, God hates divorce. Yeah. Right? You know, and it shouldn't happen. It certainly shouldn't happen among believers. But it does, occasionally. Well, when two people lawyer up and go to war, hello, both claiming to love Jesus, you know what I'm saying? Crazy. Is there nobody in the body wise enough to help go through that without both sides spending $100,000 each and ending up both of them on welfare and poverty? You know what I'm saying? Look, there is a time and a place within the body for healthy, proper judgment. Now that means that we need to be submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. We need to present ourselves and, and allow others to help guide us through. Because there will be disputes. It just will happen. How to resolve them. In first, uh, 2 Thessalonians 3, 6. In the, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching you receive from us. Look, if you have people that will not uh, behave, they just will not behave. You know, they will not get it together. There comes a point at which you have to say, okay, look, you know, we love you. We want you to go to heaven when you die. We want you to enjoy the trip. But you can't keep doing that crap here. Really, there's a necessity of that within the body. And people need to, to, to live right. Now, man, on the other hand, people need to be welcome here. People need to be able to come with whatever problems they have. There is no sexual sin, there's no immorality, there's no problem that people should not be able to come here and find Jesus. But once a person has become a believer or expressed that he's a believer or she's a believer, there are certain things that need to be required. And there comes a point that we need to help and bring discipline to one another. Are you with me? The final thing is we are to properly judge ourselves. Our text says, first take the plank out of your own eye. Now look, there are brothers and sisters who do have specks of sawdust in their eye. I reckon I have a few, and I reckon you got a few. You know, we have them. It's not inappropriate for us to help take specks out of one another's eyes, you know, medically or spiritually. However, it is a terrible problem when we try to do that and we have a beam in our own eye, and every time we go to try to get over there, we smack them upside down with our own beam. Judge yourselves, evaluate ourselves so that we are not doing this in hypocrisy. And it's not a matter of saying, there, there, my dear, let me as a spiritual expert fix your problem. See, that really smelleth, right, you know? Take the plank out. And speaking of the Lord's Supper, the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, the church in Corinth must have really been a mess with all the uh, exhortations that uh, God inspired through the Holy Spirit, the Apostle Paul, to write to, to straighten them out. 
But it says, therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. See, I don't, I really, for me personally, and I know it's different in a lot of settings, and so everybody's going to have to do what they're going to do, but I really hate for us to have communion together without at least giving a warning. Because according to what this says, let me read it again. Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. The King James says, damnation. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. Some of you have died. You just show up together and everybody, belly up, boys and girls, everybody eat, drink, and be merry. Yeehaw, we're having communion. You know, but if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. The Holy Spirit brings conviction on us from time to time, shows us our faults, shows us our weaknesses, and as we examine ourselves, as we evaluate ourselves, it's the Lord doing that so that we'll not be condemned along with the rest of the world. And communion is one of those signs. That's why, incidentally, parents and stuff, I, I, I believe that parents ought to be able to make the call as to whether their children should partake of communion. But I'm troubled sometimes by kids just coming up and taking communion. They don't have any idea necessarily what they're doing. you know. And so I think it's a parental responsibility to help them know, okay, listen, do you know what's going on here? And they don't have to have the same understanding a 90-year-old person does. But, you know, there needs to be some awareness. And if a person is not a believer, a person ought not, just because the row is moving, ought not to just partake communion because that's what everybody else is doing. There's a danger in it. Communion is a great thing, a wonderful thing, a powerful thing, but one of the crucial things that it is is a time for us to specifically ponder and evaluate and think about our relationship with the Lord and allow Him to speak into our lives and show us what needs to be done differently. Are you, you, you with me? So at times, we need to judge ourselves. Now, here's the dilemma. We are not to condemn ourselves. That's what the flesh wants to do. The world sometimes will do it, but the devil and the flesh, for sure, you know, we, gets us to pound ourselves down. There's a difference between condemnation and conviction. Conviction points out sin points out problems, points out weaknesses. The cure for conviction is confession. Agreeing with God, admitting it, dealing with it, you know, calling upon the Lord, you know, that's the cure. Condemnation is a whole different thing. Condemnation, but it masquerades as conviction. Condemnation comes down the pipe. You're worthless, you're stupid, you're dumb. If you really were a Christian, you wouldn't have even had a thought like that. You know, Jesus really is mad at you. Jesus is disgusted with you. He can't hardly stand you. You know, all, all those negative things, that's condemnation. Conviction is the Spirit of God speaking into our heart that we need to agree with God about our need and freshly call upon Him and, and deal with it in that regard. Are you, you, you with me? So as we judge ourselves, that's not the same as condemning ourselves. It's not self-loathing. Other than in the proper sense, you know, we have to loathe the, the, the works of the flesh, okay? But it's a matter of evaluating ourselves and coming to the Lord. So, folks, as believers, we are commanded to not judge. It is not my job to tell you, you know, to come in and be the Holy Spirit in your life. It's not your job to do that with me. But from time to time, it may well be our task to help bring one another to accountability. Am I doing things? Am I saying things? Am I, am I living in such a way that I'm bringing it, uh, a disrepute upon the Lord, upon the body? You know, do you see things in my life in which I'm really shooting myself in the foot? Well, you should tell me these things, and you know, we can you know and interact with them. If I look, simple example, but you know, if I have a friend and I'm standing up in front of people and I'm unzipped. <laughs> Does a friend just let it go? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Well, with, with all of us from time to time, we need to be able to take one another apart and say, Brother, look at 
this is not working well for you. I love you, but you need to work on this area because it just isn't working. Now that we can either be received or not received, but love takes that step to help us to be accountable. Are you with me? And then love on the other end receives what is genuine, evaluates, and we try to move on encouraging one another, training ourselves to distinguish the difference. So there are times that we must judge between what is right and what is wrong. We must judge between true teaching and false teaching. True teachers and false teachers. There are all kinds of doctrines. I have seen some odd stuff, man, blamed on the Holy Spirit. Have you? I mean, I just, man, I have seen people barking like dogs and carrying on and, you know, doing very peculiar things, blaming the Holy Spirit. Well, maybe, maybe not, I guess, you know. But the point that is, is significant is that we need to be led by the Word of God, by the Spirit of God, by the body of Christ. We need to be speaking into one another's lives and evaluating, is this genuinely a true doctrine? You know, from time to time, somebody will come up with, okay, Jesus is coming October 3rd, you know, whatever. Okay, well, for me, if anybody ever sets a date, immediately, I know, go right out of the shoes. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah. You know, I mean, so, because, you know, Jesus made it very clear, nobody's going to know, and when Jesus comes, everybody will know. You know, it's not going to be a secret from what I understand about the Word of God. When Jesus comes again, it's coming again. So, how, if somebody is proclaiming a thus saith the Lord about stuff that is weird and not in keeping with the word, I got a problem with that. I'm pretty suspicious of anything else they will say. Now it's not that people can't make mistakes. But when people are saying, thus saith the Lord, all of a sudden they have raised themselves to an entirely different standard. If you ever hear me say, Thus saith the Lord, I better be quoting scripture. Yeah. I can safely say, Thus saith the Lord, if I'm quoting scripture. But just because I had a lot of pizza one night and woke up in the night thinking that this seems really religious. <laughs> you know, that's, that's way different. Now, it's not that God cannot speak to us in the night and cause, you know, I mean, that can happen. But man, we better be re careful about making the proclamation, you know, this is what God is saying to the church. If it's scripture, we're okay. Now, we can be okay, but we can also even misapply Scripture. Remember, the devil quoted Scripture to Jesus when he was tempting him. The devil quotes Scripture all the time. The devil quotes this Scripture. Judge not that you be not judged. <clears throat> the devil quotes that all of the time to get God's people to shut up and dummy up and not be salt and light. So we need to be careful, even if scripture is used, that it is rightly applied. And again, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Word of God. We need the people of God. We need this package working together to encourage one another, to stir one another, to teach one another, so that together as we walk this journey, we are walking it in a creditable, faithful, genuine way, able to face whatever the world or the flesh or the devil throw at us. Because the world and the flesh and the devil will throw everything at us. And we need God's spirit and God's word and God's people to successfully navigate the minefield. Amen? Amen. Thank you for listening. For questions on today's message, please reach out to us at www.flatheadecclesia.com dot org